You know something? That opening line is very much true. What's up, bookworms and those who survived the blast? Guys, we are back today to talk a little Robert McCammon. Today, we're going all the way back to 1987. This is Swan Song, largely regarded sometimes as the, <laughs> largely regarded sometimes as the best written post-apocalyptic story of all time. Guys, this is one that people were really, really hounding me about when I reviewed The Stand two years ago. In that review, I think probably a third of the comments are like, I love The Stand. I love Swan Song. You got to do that one if you haven't done it. At the time, it's like I had heard of Robert McCammon, but I didn't know a ton about Robert McCammon. So that was really much the, the linchpin for me finally starting this was just, it got it on my radar then, and then just trying to find time to get a 919 page book onto my TBR. And thankfully it did happen this year, guys, because this was a wonderful book. Like I said, released in 1987, it did win the Bram Stoker Award that year as a co-winner. Coincidentally, it tied with Misery by Stephen King, and that's not the last time that name will come up in this review. But yeah, like I said, very well received. Lots of lists of you know best post-apocalyptic books, and this always seems to be on the list so like i said mountain of expectations going into this one and yes i've already kind of tipped my hand that i did like the book but did it meet those high expectations that were placed upon it what we're going to talk about today guys we're coming in like usual let's get into what is the book about now it is a wasteland born of rage and fear populated by monstrous creatures and marauding armies earth's last survivors have been drawn to a final battle between good and evil that will decide the fate of humanity their sister, who discovers a strange transformative glass artifact in the destroyed Manhattan streets, Joshua Hudson's the pro wrestler who takes refuge from the nuclear fallout at a Nebraska gas station, and Swan, a young girl possessing special powers, who travels alongside Josh to a Missouri town where healing and recovery can begin with her gifts. But the ancient force behind Earth's devastation is scouring the walked wounding for recruits for its relentless army, beginning with Swan herself. Guys, it takes us all the way back to 1987. This is swan song now with a book like this guys you can only begin in one place and you begin in what makes it good or bad starting with the good guys the characters oh my god there's so many of them there are probably i would say ballpark 30 to 40 plus like named characters in this book that aren't just like in passing that actually have a little bit of time on the page and don't let that overwhelm you because you're going to be interested in all of them. That's how good this is. But here's the thing is, this book has so many, it has, it has several main characters. You know, pretty much the main POV characters, which we'll, we'll talk about a little more in depth. First, I just kind of want to touch on some of these secondary characters here. Uh, I mean, there's too many to names. Rusty, Paul, Sheila, Leona, Alvin. I mean, there's, there's so many of them that are characters that you would say in any other book, these could be like a main character. But in this... They're kind of background characters, but they don't ever feel like they're in the, the background. They feel like they are very much a moving part of this world. And something that I love that he's able to do with a story like this is he has characters like this come and go from your life, just like secondary characters in your life may. And what I mean by that is in this book, guys, they are traveling great distances. And sometimes some people will decide to travel with them. And then they'll get to like a crossroads and one character will say, you know what? I'm going to try to go this way and see if some of my loved ones survive the blast. And the other ones are like, okay, we're going on this main journey. Best of luck. We wish you the best. We, we, we will pray for you kind of thing. And that's realistic. Not everyone that you meet is always going to be up to traveling across a, a, a post-apocalyptic world with you. You know, they're going to want to do some of their own things sometimes. Now, I think in this world, safety and numbers, but, you know, you can't tell the heart to do what it wants to do. You know, so I think it's a very realistic little spin that he does on some of these things is because a lot of these times you'll be like, oh, I'm waiting for this character to come back. And they don't. And they don't necessarily die. You know, and if they do, they die off page. This is just how this new world works. And I think he does that incredibly, incredibly well. So I, I think that um, any story like this, this big with a cast this big, that's a great idea. Instead of just having people there just for a body count. You can have people come and go just as they do in your real life. And that's what makes his slice of life in this 
actually quite well. Yes, slice of life in a post-apocalyptic setting can be done correctly, and Robert McCammon proves that. Now, I think with this one, the main characters we got to talk about here, got to go through each one. I'm Swan, Josh, Sister, Roland, Colonel Macklin, and to a lesser extent, uh, the uh, the man with the scarlet eye, which we'll get into a little bit later. But uh, I think I got to kind of talk about each one of these kind of POV characters here first. Swan, obviously. Uh, I don't think that this story has a main character, but I think she's the most important character. She is pretty much the the Eve of this new world. Let's put it that way. I think she's very much that if something happens to her, all hope is lost kind of thing. So she's a very central character. But again, I don't think that there's anything that I would say, oh yeah, they're the this is their story. Because it's very much an ensemble story. It is. But with Swan, I think it's great because I get my coming of age story because when the story starts... She is, you know, a very, very young girl. And by the end of this book, because there is, this book does basically take place over years and there is a small time jump. You know, she's an extraordinary young woman by the end of it. So I think that's a great journey that you go on with her. I'm not going to tell you anything about her abilities, but let's just say there is something a little otherworldly about her. And I think you will find it not far-fetched or, you know, forced in a world like this. It's actually quite welcome and it's very, very well done. And she's a character by the end of it, you just like, she must be protected at all costs. Like, uh, you know, for the, the, the people in this world and as the reader, you're like, she must be protected. So you just, you'd absolutely fall in love with this girl. Uh, for me, I think that my favorite character is going to be Josh. Uh, Josh, a former wrestler, when this all goes down, really has uh, no place really in life. And that's what you'll see with a lot of these characters is not all of them had the best life in the, you know, during the regular world, this post-apocalyptic world. I'm not sure say you call it better, but at least now they feel like they have a purpose. And with Josh, I really think he's like the... Almost like the like the Fezzik from Princess Bride, the gentle giant type. But you know, you don't want to piss him off, that sort. But I think with Josh is I, I just love that this character finds like new meaning in this in this new world of something that he needs to do. And he almost becomes like a surrogate father to Swan. He starts as like a protector for her. And he almost becomes like a surrogate father because, you know, he loves this girl to pieces and she loves him. And it's a relationship that just grows beautifully out of the most horrible of circumstances, the way it starts and the way that they meet is just an awful, awful way. But it's just a, a beautiful story between those two. And it will give you a little bit of that dad shit if you get to, if you get things like that, like I do. It's some really, really touching stuff. And I think their relationship is probably my favorite in this entire book. It's just, it's just wonderful, and I, I love Josh so, so much. Uh, sister Creep, or just Sister, as I like to call her. Sister, I think that she probably has the best character arc in this entire story, because at the beginning, you think, okay, she's just blank. She's just this. I know what she is. And slowly, over the course of the story, you see more and more unravel about her past, and you start to be like, oh my god. And yeah, I think that if there is a uh, kind of a, a glue character, a character that makes everyone stick together when things are the lowest, it's Sister, because every time you think these characters are ready to give up. Sister's always that one who's like, no, just take one more step. We can do this. We can pull together. We can get this done. And she's the kind of leader that I think you would need in a world like this. So I think you see everyone kind of grow into leadership skills as the story goes along. But Sister's always the one like from the beginning that you're like, yeah, that's the kind of person I think in the old world I would have ran away from, but in this new world I would run towards. I would want to follow this person because she seems to be the type that's going to, you know, good for morale. You know, morale is going to be in the toilets in this world for sure. But with someone like Sister, you want to just keep going. There's always going to be a ray of hope. And I think that's what makes her just such a special character. And again, her relationship with Swan, if, if, if Josh is a surrogate father, she very much becomes a surrogate mother. And it's done just beautifully well. Again, the relationship between those three characters, mm, just top-notch stuff. It really is chef's kiss. But I think you you get so much that you learn about those three characters over the course of the story that it makes the fact that his the other two POV characters are quite despicable human beings. Now, I got to start with Roland here. Roland is very much the Todd Bowden of the story. If you don't know, Todd Bowden is the protagonist of Apt Pupil by Stephen King, where I feel like this guy, kid is the most awful person in a story with an escaped Nazi. That's 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 how terrible that kid was. So uh, yeah, it was it was really, really shocking that this kid definitely seemed like he was a sociopath before, you know, everything went to hell in this world. So he was the kind of kid that definitely had some issues. He's probably the type that like, you know, would go outside and kill frogs and, and, and bunnies and things like that when his parents weren't watching. Or he would keep like carcasses in a shoebox under his bed. He definitely seemed that type. Again, I'm sure you see the the nod to Stephen King there with a kid named Roland. Uh, I, again, we'll talk about those Stephen King connections here in a little bit. But uh, I, he's a character that I think that 
would have probably ended up in jail in the real world, and he actually is the type that would thrive in this new world. And that's that's well on display here because you see him just go further and further down the path of corruption in this story. And it's 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 actually kind of nice. That it's kind of weird that we use the word nice with Roland. Is with Roland and Colonel Macklin, which I'll touch on in a second, is that he gives you the other page. You see, they don't think they're the bad guys. And I love that kind of villain is you're the good guy in your own story. And they don't think that they're doing anything wrong. They think that what they're doing is to preserve humanity. And, you know, we as the reader can look and be like, no, you guys are psychotic. But to them, seeing their point of view, I think that really helps make them really compelling villain, villains. With Colonel Macklin, you know, he sees... Uh, he see, I almost called him Todd. He sees Roland pretty much as like this ball of clay that he can form exactly what he wants. And there's a few times where he's like, yeah, I think this kid might be way more evil than I think he is, you know, or I want him to be. So that's kind of a nice one-two punch. He looks at, he looks at Roland kind of like his protege, but I don't think he needs much nudging from Colonel Macklin, a character that I think, uh, obviously, again, he adds layers to these things because these are this is a villain, Colonel Macklin, that that's you know you think oh he's just a spickle for no reason no you see this guy's got quite a dark past a relationship with his father is obviously going to kind of come into play and things like this and that's just something that's you can see a little bit of that in every kind of villain out there that really might not ever be displayed well but McCam is able to peel those layers back and show us why he isn't just a mustache twirling bad guy again he thinks he's doing this for the right reasons but as a reader you're going to be like no you're you're just despicable you're just disgusting and some chapters with Roland and Macklin you will be like what are what am I reading right now that will happen to you more than once and that brings me to the man of many names actually that's not actually they just have several names for him this one they call him friend they call him the man of many faces the man with the scarlet eye this is very much uh, the man in black Randall Flagg in this world. And I think this is what gets all those comparisons to the stand because it does have that kind of that dark omnipotent figure who is, you know, plotting, pulling strings to do things uh, his own way. But what I like about this version of the character is that he's, unlike Randall Flagg, at the beginning of this, he's kind of like, huh, they're going to do this on their own. I didn't even have to do anything to make them nuke themselves. You know, I think that that's just such... A neat idea. So you don't really know what his overall arcing plan is. Probably most of the book, you don't really know what his plan is, but you're so, so compelled with this character. You want to know more. You want to know what his goal is. What really is he up to? But uh, I, I, will not, I will not spoil that for you, but I just say it's a very interesting character done in a very different way than the Man in Black, I think, would have. And I think that's what makes it uh, not make me fall back on the, is it the stand or is it Swan Song? Which one's better? I don't fall back on that because I feel like there's similarities, yeah, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, it's, it's never a thing where I feel like, oh, this is just a straight copy of the stand. So don't worry about it. Get that out of your head right now. Definitely not, especially not when it comes to the Man with the Scarlet Eye. Now, with this, guys... I think one of the best things about it is his attention to detail. He does something that like not a lot of other post-apocalyptic... I don't know why I struggle so hard to say post-apocalyptic sometimes. It just, it's a, I don't know, it makes me mumble a little bit. But most post-apocalyptic books don't focus on the world very much. What happens to the world after something like this? It's all about the characters. And I am a character first guy, I'm fine with that, but I love his attention to detail on how this would affect the world, how this would affect the environment, how this would affect wildlife. For example, he has a thing about like, oh, well, I can't believe the, the wolves and, and the bobcats and stuff are coming down out of the mountains because, hey, their food source has run out. They're gonna come down to the mainland. They're gonna come out of the mountains and they're gonna start hunting humans. You know, things like that, that I think a lot of these types of books don't ever touch on. So I love little attention to detail, how it affects the weather patterns and things like that. Obviously, a nuclear winter is going to be something that you have to kind of take into account. And it's done really well. I think he really did do his homework. He did a lot of, of, of research, I'm thinking, on what life would be like after the mushroom cloud clears. And that's very, very clear here. And I think it just really helps add to the grittiness and the just the, how the disgust of having to live in this world he does that very very well describing like the clothes that people wear the uh, effects to uh, people's appearance obviously is going to be a big one it's a huge one in this one and I, I won't spoil that for you guys there's like there's a huge thing with let's just say the next step in humanity's evolution process is kind of it's kind of actually uh, examined this book but it's, it's it's done really well his his attention to how uh, everything in the world and in humans would react to a post-apocalyptic nature after you know uh, the big one gets dropped but uh with me guys this one just it's the journey both the physical 
and the mental. These characters are traveling great distances uh, to try to find things. I won't tell you what. And then they also have like the spiritual journey. A lot of these characters are out to find themselves in this new world. And it's those type of characters who would have had a mundane and just a sad ending to their life in the regular world. And in this world, they have a purpose. I think that's something that is just absolutely the theme of the story. And he just hits a home run with it. It's just beautiful, the journey that some of these characters take. And because he's so good at Slice of Life, you don't mind it taking 919 pages to get there. You are in it, you are in it with every single character. You want to see them succeed or fail. You know, you hate to love or love to hate everybody. There's no one here where you're just like, ah, whatever, I'm kind of indifferent on that character. Everyone you're going to feel some type of way about with a cast this large, that's quite a unique talent. And I just feel like by the end of this, man, you feel like you have went to hell and back with these characters. I think it's like the most, it's like uh, Frodo and the, and the Fellowship going to Mordor, you know, before I felt like I really went to hell and back with some of these characters. And it's just, it's so well done, guys. It really is just an incredible journey for everyone involved. And I think you, you'll, you'll have a good time with it. Now, for the bad guys, I don't have anything. It's really going to be nitpicking if I try to find something bad with this. Um, maybe some things might seem dated. I don't know because it was written in 1987. We've learned things about you know how things would react to a, to a nuclear holocaust and things like that. We've, we've learned different things maybe that you might look at and be like, ah, oh, no, the science might be wrong on that. Or things that, you know, you might just say, hey, you know, that's, that's a very 1987-ism. That's going to happen. You know, 1987 New York is going to seem a little different than today, right? So there will be little things like that, I think, that might make it seem dated. But to me, it's just like, don't put it in today's world. Look at it in 1987. Look at this as an alternate timeline. That's not a problem. Obviously, guys, you're dealing with a book like this, uh, content warning. There's going to be some things that make you uncomfortable. I don't think you go into a book, uh, you know, after the bombs are dropped and how would humanity treat one another without expecting some bad things. There are going to be some things that are very difficult for you to read. There is a lot of violence in this. And it's going to be some things that will make you be like, oh, yeah. So uh, don't go into this expecting a PG Disney adventure. This is very much in the same vein as a Stephen King. You're going to be uncomfortable quite a bit. And uh, I think maybe some might find it too long. Look, it ain't short. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a big, big book. Just like I said with The Stand, don't treat this as something you've got to get through. Treat this as a journey. Just accept you're not going to be reading anything else for a minute. The thing with me, this book just flew by. It just flew by. There's never a dull moment in this book. And I wanted it to be a thousand pages longer. I'm not kidding. I wanted it to be like a five book series. That's how much I enjoyed it. So uh, the, the length didn't bother me. If you just don't like long books, I guess, I would say, yeah, it might not be for you. But I think you won't ever feel like it feels as long as it actually is. And that's quite the feat. But how about why you should read it, guys? I think that you've probably noticed the Stephen King references. And I'm going to kind of address those now. Yes, it is very similar to The Stand. No, I don't think it's just a ripoff of The Stand. Here's what I've always said. Every once in a while, you'll have two stories that seem very similar. Like, for example, Deep Impact and Armageddon. And both were actually quite good, if not different. I think that this book does some things better than The Stand. I think that The Stand does some things better than this book. They're both wonderful books. And I think if you like The Stand, you're going to love this book. If you love this book, you're going to love The Stand. I definitely think that's it. I don't understand this thing where we've got to choose one of them. I definitely feel like they could be neighbors. They're both incredible stories. I don't feel like they're the same story. One deals with, you know, 99% a, a of the population dies because of a virus. This one deals with the aftermath of a nuclear war. So it's, it's, it's going to be quite different, but there's going to be a lot of things that are kind of the same, trying to reestablish society, the dangers of that world. Obviously, these things are going to kind of be similar, but I don't think it's a similar story in that regard, except maybe you know, the man in black, the, the, the man with the scarlet eye. That might be the only thing where you're like, okay, this feels extremely similar. But I think that the stories feel so different. The characters are so different. You're never, ever going to be like, oh, yeah, this come on. Come on. Steve did this you know, eight years earlier than you. No, I, I don't think you're ever going to feel like that. I, I, I don't. I think that if you love the stand and you're just wanting some more, pick this up immediately. You're going to be right at home because it does. I mean, this book could have Stephen King as the author in the title, and I might have believed it. Uh, it's it's really that good. And that's the highest compliment that I can give an author is that your book is could pass as my favorite author's you know, one of his books. So I think that if you are a Stephen King fan, obviously you're going to enjoy this quite a bit. Like I said, with Boy's Life by McCammon as well. So uh, yeah, that's, that's really the only sales pitch I got for you. If you love great, great characters and seeing them go through a journey and major character arcs and their relationships with one another, 
this is for you. You're going to love this. Again, if the length doesn't bother you, this book is going to be an all-timer for you, as I think it is for me. I love it. It's a good spiritual journey, as well as a mental journey, as well as a physical journey, and again, characters that just never give up. Those are the types of characters I love, a character that works hard, and these characters work for every single inch that they get, and I just love that. I adore some of these characters. So, final thoughts, guys. If you can't tell, I loved this book to pieces. I've waited this long to do the review because I just so much that had to marinate really because I just I loved it so much. I wanted to make sure that it wasn't like a recency thing. It's not. I think the arrow is only pointing up since I finished the book. And when I finished the book, I said that's one of the best books I've ever read. So uh yeah, highest, highest of recommends for this book. It's just mountain of expectations I had for it, especially after I read Boy's Life, which I loved by Robert McCammon. And this blew it away. This blew Boy's Life away, which is a superb book. And I, I don't imagine anything's going to top this for my book of the year right now. Spoiler, you know, for that list later this year. But uh, it just exceeded every single expectation that I had. 919 pages just zipped right by. I, I would say I read this book probably in four or five days. It was so good. You just could not put it down. It's that type that every single time you had a free second, you said, I got to get back to that book. That's how good it was. And it just... The books like that don't come along often for me where it's like I am going to try to make an excuse to get I've almost called into work to stay home and read this book. That's how damn good it was. And this is is it just like one of the best books I've read this year, guys? This is one of my one of the best books I've ever read. Got into my head right now, top twenty book, without a doubt, all time for me. I I, I don't know where it might end up at the end. I've never actually thought about putting that list together, but it would be there. It would definitely be there. It's just a magnificent book. There's not a thing that I would change about it. Only thing I'd change is it would have been longer, but you know, then that leaves you the opportunity of maybe overstaying your welcome. I don't know, but I think it's just perfectly paced. The characters are all magnificent, and you're never going to be bored, and you are going to have an emotional journey with those characters, because I won't lie to you guys, I wept like a baby the last 30 pages of this book. It was that special. So much so that I had a hangover right after I finished it. I was like, I read Call of the Wild right after. I was like, is Call of the Wild this sad or am I still just weepy over Swan Song? So yeah, guys, can't tell. Absolutely amazing book. I think everyone needs to do it ASAP, especially if you love The Stand, if you love Stephen King. This book is going to just be a grand slam for you. Pick it up. Like I said, it has one of the best first lines of all time. You will read that first line, guys. You'll be like, wow, that's very reminiscent of Fahrenheit 451, and you will not be able to stop. It's just an amazing, amazing journey. And I don't know, because I don't audio, guys, but I have been told by damn near everyone on my Discord that the audiobook performance is brilliant. So if you think that this might be a little too long for you to read and you're an audiobooker, hey, uh, I would say that it's probably worth it to pick up the audiobook because I think everyone needs to go on this adventure. It is worth your time and money. So Guys, Swan Song by Robert McCammon. Have you read it? What do you think about it? What do you think it is compared to The Stand? Drop in the comments and let me know, guys, and I will talk to you there.